Welcome back to the World Tellers Podcast. Um, we're going to jump into the Old Testament today. So Leviticus? Leviticus. Put ourselves back under lay the, down law. the law. Uh, no, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, uh, verse 12 through 26. 26. Um, I'm reading the ESV. Silky smooth, baby. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun, This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation, Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. It's really depressing. It can be if you... And who wrote this? It's believed to have been Solomon. King Solomon. The wisest. The wisest man who ever lived. You guys want me to share my thoughts? Please. Yeah, brother. <laughs> this was Finn's verse. Yeah, Finn picked us up. Anyway, so we are at church on Sunday. Um, the pastor used this. It wasn't like the focal point of his Jim sermon. No. <laughs> James Cool. <laughs> um, Connect Christian Church. Um, it was good. It was a good message. Um, we're going through a whole book series, and th- this week was kind of like how we should manage our money and be good stewards of what God's gifted us and treat treat our relationship with what we have as managers, not as owners. It's not, it's not ours in the end. It's something that we, and he, he tied this verse in, but I, I like this verse. Too. It, it went perfectly along with the sermon, but it's also more broadly speaking, it's like everything I just, everything he laid out there. And even if you go out to the beginning of the chapter, chapter two, and it's, um, it's a hundred percent true. Absolutely. 100% true that, it is all vanity and meaningless and pointless, but there's a big, but a big asterisk apart from Christ. Mm. This is 100% the case and true life is meaningless. You can strive and achieve and do everything you want. At the end of the day, you're going to pass away. Death is coming for us all. It doesn't matter if you live the last 10 years of your life as a homeless man on the street, addicted to drugs, or you live your last 10 in a beautiful retirement, comfortable in Florida, playing golf every day of the week. At the end of the day, it ends. Mm-hmm. And in John was saying even before the podcast, like a hundred years from now, you will literally not be remembered. Your grandchildren will be in their sixties. You know what I'm saying? It's like life is so short and it's it comes and goes so fast and you can achieve and achieve and do everything you can in this life. But if apart from Christ, it's all ultimately meaningless. If God does not exist, then nihilism is the proper response life is utterly meaningless and everything we achieve here is going to terminate in the end it doesn't matter if you're the worst person in the world 
or Mother Teresa if God does not exist. And um, I think that's a reality that everybody needs to appreciate. But it's not, we're not those without hope. Um, but it's a healthy reminder that if you are striving to do things apart from Christ, they're not eternal. And you can still function in this mode where it's true for what you're doing right now. If you're walking apart from the spirit, I think things done in the spirit are the only things that are eternal. Those are my initial thoughts on that mm. passage. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I would a hundred percent agree. I think when he uses the phrase under the sun, which is, you know, basically means apart from God, um, and apart from God, everything is meaningless and has no, no weight to it. But with, with Christ, then everything has eternal weight and meaning. Um, and so all the things that he talks about as being <clears throat> vanity, and cr- like with Christ, now all of those things have are of utmost importance. That's how I kind of view it. Mm. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it, sorry, um, and it, to me, so I've been, by the grace of God, been walking with the Lord for twenty five years now. Since and, out of the womb. <clears throat> yeah, my my experience would tell how me how old Calvinism are you? You're you're twenty five now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you know, I've been very fortunate not to have to experience much of life without you know, being apart from the Lord. And so for me, this is like a glimpse of somebody who doesn't have Christ and and how life must be um, and ultimately how it has to be apart from God. But, um, and and yeah, I I just, um, it's, it's allows me to see what somebody who doesn't have God, what their life ultimately is. If they spend time to reflect on it, I yeah, think, yeah. What were you gonna say, Josiah? Um, I've, I've always connected with the Book of Ecclesiastes because I think my natural, um, the way I lean is more pessimistic anyway. So even it's like if I'm doing something really fun, somewhere in my hot head it's like, but it's you know we only got an hour left, and then this is it, and you, you know that, my mind will just go there like oh birthdays, it's like I'm. 30 well that means like i'm a third through my life if i'm live a full life. i mean those are just thoughts that i'm i don't have to like work to generate those just come to me so that's my natural leaning so when i read this there's a huge part where it's like yep totally agree makes perfect sense like i can relate fully and i don't even have all the amazing things that Sol if solomon was the one that wrote it which uh, i mean everything seems to make sense that he was the one who wrote it but the wisest man but also like the richest man like had everything you could have from a physical you know worldly material side of things and pretty much is writing this <clears throat> out of wisdom pretty much saying all these things are, are meaningless in the ultimate sense and it's like yeah totally agree with that and I never, even as a Christian, I spent a lot of time like still wrestling with that where it's like I have Jesus, but like my life feels meaningless, you know, even that sense and never really figuring out how to combine the two. And I think that term under the sun that when you were reading it again, that's what kept sticking out to me under the sun and that idea that in the physical Everything done under the sun, if it's only in the physical, is ultimately meaningless. Even in like the most, the the people that we put on the like the Jeff Bezos and the I don't Mark Zuckerberg, I, who's the guy uh, yeah, Elon Bates. Musk, like the people that are like doing all these amazing mm-hmm. things and like have all the material wealth <laughs> there is, in the most ultimate sense. Like, they're just slowly trending towards the fact that they're going to be gone off this earth. And there'll be effects of what they did here. But in the ultimate sense, it's all meaningless if there's if it's all physical. So under the sun. And, but it's like, I believe that there's this Jesus, but I still kind of lived under the sun most of my life. Where it's like, I don't know how to combine the two. Um, but I do think if you start to bring the physical things that we have to do, our work, our, the, just the, the things that must be done in life to function in life. I don't think are bad in and of themselves. I think they're meaningless if they're done apart from God. I think they have eternal weight and purpose if they're done in Christ. Mm. And I was thinking about this is like, and I don't know 
Jeff Bezos. Like, so I'll, I'll just use him as an example because there's Amazon mm-hmm. places. Well, I don't know. I, I I don't think he's a Christian, but I have no idea. I've never actually looked into his belief system. But let's just say he's not a Christian. So everything he's ever done in the ultimate sense, in the eternal sense, is meaningless apart from Christ. Josiah, if Josiah did one act of changing my child's diaper in a sense of pure love and in Christ, which I'm not saying I know how to fully do that, but in the eternal sense, me changing a diaper in the proper mode of being has more weight than everything Jeff Bezos will ever accomplish in life. And if I start to live in that perspective where it's like this interaction with I have with this person, if I'm doing it with the mode of like Christ, I want you to speak in and through me, or I, I want to present your love to this person in a real and meaning, meaningful and genuine way. If I start to live in that mode of being, those things have eternal weight that is more important than all these things that we look at and like, look at what Elon Musk has done. He's going to get us to Mars one day. Like, and I'm not saying those things are bad in and of themselves, but it starts to bring meaning to your life in the most <clears throat> practical sense. Cause unless something crazy happens, I will never have anywhere close to the amount of wealth that any of those people have. And I can be like, well, if I never get there, then I'll never be fulfilled. Or I can recognize I can be fully fulfill- fulfilled in what I'm doing right now because my fulfillment does not come from these things. It comes from Christ. Mm. <clears throat> um, on that note, actually, since you brought up Elon Musk, uh, I was just watching something. Um, or maybe it was on an article, like a finance article or whatever. But just recently, Warren Buffett, who's, um, I think, upper 80s, maybe 90, um, was saying that, but he tweeted something. Basically, the gist of it was that at the end of the day, time is the true current. Or uh, he was talking about like you, you can't buy any more time. And then Elon Musk replied, "Yes, time is the true currency." Well, I read that as a God-fearing man, as someone who believes completely in eternal life. It's like, yeah, yeah. After all of this toils, it's like, oh my goodness. You know, there are people on earth already who are like nah man this this life is just but a whim like what are you doing like your mind should be on the things that are eternal you know and then you have two of the richest people in the world um out of eight billion the couple at the top are saying oh man no time is the true currency and uh, mm-hmm. you know so anyway um yeah man i i don't i feel like i got a slightly different take or maybe not sometimes i maybe imagine um that we're having that we're saying different things even then I'll, I'll like listen to the podcast later and be like oh no they were they were actually saying the same thing but um like when i read this i don't know like i haven't i'm not a bible scholar i haven't studied it but what when i hear him say under the sun you know i'm thinking about like like everything on earth you know what i'm saying like i, I don't think he's including heaven under that and that's probably that may be the same thing you're saying but like everything on earth and all these things he's describing are like earthly things earthly earthly pleasures if you go back to i'm just gonna go all the way back to verse two verse verse one i said to myself come on let's try pleasure let's look for the good things in life but i found that this too was meaningless so i said laughter is silly what good does it what good does it do to seek pleasure After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine, and while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my house. I also owned large herds of flocks, more than any of the kings who had, who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women. I had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire! Exclamation point. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard for, or so hard to accomplish, it was also mean- meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. I don't know, man. When I'm reading that, and then, of course, everything we just read from 12 to... Yeah. It's like every everything he's talking about is are, are like gains on earth. They're gains on, on earth. Mm-hmm. And if, at some point, you are going to die, and it's all going to pass away. But there are also things here we can pursue that, are, that have eternal weight. Yes. 
like leading someone to Christ, that's an eternal thing. <coughs> Raising children that are that are that have genuine faith and are able to see genuine faith in you, like that's an eternal thing. That's huge, and we, we can never know. You know, like um, Mr. Lamb was talking about when he was on here. Like you just can't know three or four generations down how big that wave has gotten just from just from sharing the gospel with one person and then they or, or two and they share two you know it's the the whole the whole argument of um you know two brings two brings two and before you know it you've got like a thousand people and so i don't know man uh, when i'm when i'm reading this it's just like it's almost like a warning from someone and you hear about it all the time like you know actors who have everything they have all this money and fame and everything they thought they wanted and they're just they're super depressed and they're like talking about suicide or committing suicide or whatever and it's just like how's that possible you like what you, there's nothing under the sun you couldn't have and yet it's nothing for them and some of them will come out and say it and i think that's what solomon's doing he's like hey man let me save you some time building that huge house and those huge gardens there's always gonna be someone bigger and it's never going to be enough and it's not going to fulfill you and that's you know i mean i know i'm saying saying the obvious here but it's like it's like, let me save you some time. All these things are not going to fulfill you. And at some point, they're going to go away. And mm-hmm. so in my mind, when I hear that, and I'm in a different <clears throat> time, I'm after Christ was born, whereas he was before Christ was born in here. So I know eternal life exists, and I know that I can be doing things with my life that do have eternal weight. And so for me, it's just like, this, is, this just bolsters that understanding that I've already kind of come to. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like you pointed out. He is um, Solomon is like the epitome of human success. You can just put him as that placeholder. Whoever you view as being that, just assume that they're writing this in a sense um, that they've gotten to the pinnacle, achieved the greatest feats that human could could achieve. He had all the wisdom, he had all the pleasure, he had all the material wealth and possessions. He couldn't spend it all if he tried, you know, had it all. And he's like, it's all utterly meaningless because it comes to an end. And at the end of the day, it's pointless. Um, And it would be if we can learn from that, because we all do it. We all pursue things um, that we think are going to make us happy, even if it's for a week or a day or a month. Um I mean that to be honest it I mean obviously to a far lesser extent than than Solomon but I kind of came to that realization in my own life when I was in a I'd say in a darker place um well yeah definitely darker place in my life just behavioral wise and what I was doing and um living in sin and and it is like but I had I had a lot of what the world would be like that's that's what you need to be happy and none of it was brought that happiness it was momentary pleasures and that's what he said you know one through 12 is kind of or one through 11 is he's kind of talking about look i'm going to pursue pleasure let's see if that's the the answer then 12 through 26 where we were just reading it's like i'm going to pursue the work and wisdom and living in the light and doing the good things like you you hear a lot of gurus nowadays talking about like optimize your life like get the most productivity out of your life like earn the most money make the most sales have the best body do the most working out do like all these things, none of that's meaningful either if it's done apart from Jesus. Um, Which, the, the, that's not new. I mean, Dale Carnegie and all, the, yeah, all those yeah. guys back yeah. in there were saying the same thing. It's like, oh my goodness, if a human being, if you just woke them up, put them on an assembly line, whatever, whatever, they wouldn't have to drive back home from And people hated it, you know, but they were like, okay, this would be the most optimum thing. And they were trying to figure out if there was yeah. a, but the reality is that it's, it's meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> At some point, people figured it out. <laughs> Well, it, it's like if anybody that can read through this and actually in take take it for what it is and really they're going to save themselves so much pain heartache and suffering and strife and struggle trying to get the not that these things are bad things but they've got to have their proper context they are not the ultimate they're not the transcendent they're not the thing that we're going to find ultimate meaning and purpose and they can point to the ultimate and they can and these are things that can be enjoyed Yes, in, in their proper perspective. Yes, yes. That's what I'm thinking. Is is it a is it more of a what versus a why? Like, so the what's are the enjoying food and you know having home and things. The material is that 
the thing that he's speaking like we should avoid these things or is it like the mode of being by which we are see i think he's more talking about the, the why and the how yeah. um of the matter and and then if and then i guess depending on how you fall on that it would be how you kind of read through the you know the, the book and maybe how you apply some of those things to your life i probably fall more in the camp of not necessarily the we should do this, we shouldn't do this, and more of like the mode of being by which I operate in my day-to-day -day life. What is that? Is it rooted and grounded in trying to live a life to bring glory to God in the mundane things of life while I'm at work, 40 hours a week, while I'm at home the rest of the time, and then have these little windows of time where I do intentional things, Wednesday night Bible group, our Sunday morning thing, some things of serving, this, like, are those the only times where these are eternal things or can eternal things apply to all aspects of my life? And then if, if I do view it that way, then it starts to bring weight to all those areas of my life. Um, and, and anyway, so I, I've always kind of viewed it more of like, well, why are we doing these things? Is it to find meaning for our soul? You're not going to find it there. Mm -hmm. If that if your purpose to get this bigger house is to find meaning for your soul, he's telling you right there, it ain't going to work out the way you think. It's actually going to leave you feeling more empty on the back end. Mm. But is there a benefit? I mean, I don't, you know, once again, we can, we can, well, we shouldn't have this big of a house. And if we look at, I'm not, it's, these are all hypotheticals, but if in, I think it's more about the mode of being. And Jonathan talked about like time is the ultimate cur currency. And there's this quote by Voltaire where it says fiat currency will eventually return to its intrinsic value, which is zero. And I think as Christians, I mean, think about that for a little bit. One, we live in a fiat currency world. So there's a level where it's like, it's a facade. It is a facade. Now we op we all operate, and we're pretty much in agreement that we're going to operate like this right now until there's some huge shakeup. But we as Christians live most of the time operating out of using a fiat currency to operate in our life. And I think what this is saying is, if you use that fiat currency to attain what you think is it's it's all a zero in the ultimate end game. But if we start to use the currency of love in Christ Jesus, then then we're starting to attain things that are. Uh, eternal. We're starting to build up on a foundation that will not burn away. I don't want my life. I don't. I'm not a in Christ. I'm not afraid of when I stand at the judgment seat that He's going to say Josiah, not because of anything I did, but I don't think He's going to judge me, my identity. I think He's going to judge my what what I did, what I did, and those things will either burn away or those will be things that I'll be able to lay at His feet for all eternity. Mm -hmm. and, and so I want to be able to lay as many things at His feet. For all eternity. That's the way I perceive it. I could be wrong exactly what that really looks like. But I'm not afraid of, oh, 50% of Josiah is not going to make it into heaven because 50% wasn't redeemed. No, I'm fully redeemed in Christ. But my life is either going to be, that was all fiat currency, that all is a zero, or... Oh, you! It's gold. You did the dishes that night, and that is going to stay with you for all eternity. because the, Not because you did the dishes, but why and how you did the dishes yeah and that starts to bring like a perspective change and in my opinion has brought a way more abundant life to to life as opposed to like i need to get i need to get past these things so i can get to that abundant life which are these specific periods of time that you know are set aside and i think there's an importance of that i don't want to mitigate that i think there's an importance to be intentional and to have times for that but if that is the only time where those are eternal then the rest of my life the vast majority of my life no matter how I cut it up, ends up becoming meaningless. Yeah. So anyway, and, it, and it, why why have you set those uh, intentional times apart if it has no impact on the rest right. of right. Your life? Yeah, where Matthew six nineteen through twenty one says, "Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, but and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys." And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And um, where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. And I think our heart will find peace in the one true treasure that is eternal. And every other treasure that we try to seek and, and our heart try to rest in, it makes it uneasy. And, and ultimately, if you can read this and then not pursue these things of the world in a way that you think you're going to get life and meaning from them, then you're free to pursue them for God's glory, for his benefit. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added. And yes, you're well aware of the fact that the car I'm driving now will go away. The house I'm in will eventually crumble and fall. 
all the money I've ever earned will disappear in the reversion to zero that all fiat currency does or be given to ancestors. Either way, I'm not going to be spending it. And I'm not trying to clutch at these things to get life and meaning and purpose because they're just tools. Mm-hmm. I'm just a manager, a steward of these things for a season for my life. And the the goal is to do it all in pursuit of, of God's kingdom and to his glory. And then that's where you find ultimate meaning. Now we say all these things, man, really embodying that and walking that out and going in that, in that way, I think brings transformation to your own life and then those that you're impacting around you. And, um, that's somebody that you want to be around. If, if you're also pursuing the light, if you're in the darkness, you don't want to be around somebody like that. It's, on a side note, but it's um, light to your, yeah, you can see it. And it just, it's like watering a garden. It's just bringing fresh living water to plants and people all around you. And it's just, you can see it starts to flourish and the sun's bright and the garden's thriving. And it's like, that's, that's the life that we want to um, be pursuing. And it's like, yeah, even in bad circumstances, if you're pursuing those things, the garden's still thriving in a deepest eternal sense. Even when the world's perspective of it looks terrible, it's like, no, it's still deeply meaningful. And, um, yeah, it's just, can we take this and actually get it without having to pursue it, live it, and then finally realize, yeah, he was right. I think a lot of times we've come kind of back down to like the doing the dishes analogy and I'm just at least I do. (laughs) No, every time. And I'm at least going to offer up like, so I I understand the analogy there. I guess my fear is that like there's two ways to go here. So just pointing out both sides of there. One is that you read this and it's like, okay, well, this was apart from God. And so he's saying all this apart from God, which I agree. If someone's apart from God, then this is 100% true. Like literally everything you do on earth, will be like absolutely meaningless. But if you look at Matthew 1, 7, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like Solomon had a, Solomon feared the Lord. And I mean, if it was counted as righteous, that Abraham believed God and it was counted as righteousness for him, you know, I, I would hate to say that Solomon had no relationship with God. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, even from that lens, it's like, okay, well, I mean, he, he didn't know Jesus, obviously, and didn't know the story of Jesus per se. But so it, He's saying all of this is true, even even with his relationship with God, as the king of Israel. <clears throat> and I think I think there there's two there's two ways we can go about it where we can say, okay, we can look at this and say, Oh man, this person who had it all is saying, Hey, if you ever attain all of this wonderful earthly things it's it's like it literally is meaningless it doesn't even say that it's not going to fulfill you it says this is meaningless at the end of your life and we all eventually that there's one thing we're promised it is there is going to be an end of our life and so on one side is to say okay well if we have a relationship with god though i think the the slippery and i'm not saying anyone's saying this but the slippery side is well no if i have a relationship with christ then all of these things are okay or whatever, and I, th- I think a lot of times as Christians, we it's so easy to kind of still fall into the same things that literally the rest of the world does. Even people who are not Christians, what do they want? Well, I want a big house. I want it to be. I want everything to be kept. I want to have good kids. I want to be smart. I want. It's like okay, if you look at those two lists of what they think life should be like, and a Christian today should should be like like all of those things are the same. I want to be able to have pleasure. I want to be able to whatever. I don't want to stress about money. I don't want to do you know, I don't want everything to be like nice and neat and organized and, and stress free. And like that's that's the human condition, you know? It has nothing to do with you know, like the people who have nothing to do with God want the same exact things. And so if you look at those two people's lives, it's hard to distinguish. And I realize that a lot of things as far as our relationship with God are internal. And those those moments at the dishes can can be completely different but they they want their dishes done too and they're trying to make their wife happy or not you know what i mean like a lot of times i'm i'm doing the dishes because i want to serve lauren or whatever someone who is in a a good healthy relationship who has nothing to do with god wants the same things and will do things for the same reasons or oh okay i want our whatever so you know what i'm saying and so how different are those two things and i think what 
So on one side, I think the slippery slope is be like, oh, no, well, as long as I have a relationship with God, then all of these things I can still do. And I think a lot of us in the back of our mind are still kind of pursuing that, like, oh, I need a little bit bigger house. That would look good. Or I like the way I feel when I pull up in this car. Or I like all of these things that are just the same as everyone. And I think what he's saying here is, hey, the other side of that is we can look at this and be like, hmm, what if I did spend a little bit less of my time shooting for these things or a lot less of my time shooting for these things in order to be able to focus on real eternal things now that we know about eternity we know about the story of Christ who who died for us and it's like things that are I, I think there's two sides to it we can take exactly what we're doing and not change a thing because it works or we can read this and, and be challenged to be like man there may be in the end there may be a day where we're like man I'm glad I I'm glad I, I spent more time trying to actually build God's kingdom instead of building my own kingdom or to tend my own garden. And so, I don't know. That, that, that's what I that's what I see when I read that. And I, I think it's at least bring it up as like this could challenge us in a way, um, you know, that that could spur action or or not. But I do like where it's. Uh, I mean, it's challenging to me where it's uh, like because me, I'm like, okay, well, instead of eating out. And having you know nice food and drink, let's eat cheaper food or whatever, and we'll put that into an investment. And then for our kids, and in sixty years, five dollars equals two thousand. And so you know all of that actually makes it real. You know what I mean? And what it sounds like what he's saying here is enjoy enjoy good food and drink, well, and also find satisfaction see, in the work he, you do. Yes, I don't think he's talking about like we should not do any of those things. I still go back to I think he's talking about apart from God, because. I mean, he says, I hated all my toil. So are we supposed to not toil and work? Or is that... I'm just asking the question. Oh, asking me? Yeah. Um, so, once again, I, I think... Like, I think a lot of times we go to work... Like, think of how many people have, like, amazingly stressful jobs. And they're like, well, at least I'm getting a paycheck. Like, I remember when I was in a different kind of sales. When I was in sales, it was like, I hated my job. I was so stressed out all the time where my chest was like was like tight and I would have to call Lauren and she would like kind of talk me down. And I, I remember that's when I learned how to do breathing exercises just for stress. Nothing other than stress. I was just behind the ball. Could never catch up. There was always somewhere else I had to be plus paperwork. Yada, yada. And it, but at the end of the day, I was like, but when the check came in, it was like, okay, well that makes it feel a little better. And I think what he's saying here is like, that ain't it. At the end of your life, there's not going to be much fruit from that because the money will be gone. And all of that time that you could have spent either enjoying what you do or whatever, you know what I'm, So when I see that, I, I don't think that toiling in itself is wrong, but I think um, I, I'm absolutely on board with the fact that the reason for your toiling and the reason for what you're doing needs to be um, in a healthy place. And it says, do something that you enjoy, do it like find satisfaction in the work you're doing. You know what I mean? So maybe, I don't know, when I read that, I'm like, okay. I think it's okay to make less money and do something that I love to do, you know, than to make a ton of money and hate my life. I mean, I think most people would agree, but there's something else I was going to say and it was really good and it's gone. <clears throat> I, I hear your, I'm agree with, I agree with your, the point you were making. Um, cause I think we can deceive ourselves and be like, well, I, I'm doing all these things, but they're not meaningless because I have Jesus. So I'm good. Or it's like maybe the whole motive, uh, the whole directionality and, and what you're pursuing in life in general is going to change because you have Jesus. And yeah, I, and I think that will happen. And I think what's important is the, your heart, the condition of your heart. Are you pursuing these things from a place of self selfish interest thinking even though you're a believer and you have Jesus, that these things are going to give me meaning, purpose, and enjoyment in life that will fulfill me? Or are you finding your fulfillment in Jesus, ultimately, knowing that that's the only place to find deep, eternal fulfillment? And on the side, you are doing these things to his glory, at, to the best of your ability, knowing that I'm not earning up possessions for me and mine and me, me, me. It's like whatever I get is the Lord's ultimately. And I'm just a steward of that. And there's a tremendous freedom in that because then you're not concerned if it's coming in or going out or you're not, you're, you're a generous giver because you have the ability to do that. And you're like, 
you know what I'm saying? So it's like one person's life that's walking with the Lord might be like, I'm selling everything. I'm going to the mission field. One person's life might be, I'm building multiple million dollar businesses. I'm selling them. I'm blessing nonprofits left and right. The church community is growing. I started this pro, you know what I'm saying? Like two totally different ways about going about it, but both are genuinely from their heart serving the Lord. And that's the important thing. And that's going to manifest differently in all of our lives. Like Josiah sold out living completely for the Lord and his kingdom is going to look different than John sold out living completely. There's going to be similarities, overlaps and all of that, but Mm -hmm. Christ might want to use your life in this way and this, this way of operating and this, this job and this career. And then for Brad is something different, but it's like what he's concerned about and what is eternal is doing any one of those things with the proper heart condition, directionality to your life. And it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to cook an amazing dinner and buy the top steak, but guess what? I'm going to invite somebody over and fellowship with them and just build relationship. You know what I'm saying? It's like just little things like that. And, um, I, I mean, again, everything that is joy, everything that is good in life that we enjoy and find pleasure in, God created those things, and He wants us to find joy and pleasure in those things, but always with the reality in mind that this is not the ultimate. These are just pointers, like C.S. Lewis would talk about, like the ray of sun is just pointing back to the sun itself, the source of the light, and that's everything that we have in this earth, in this time, in its proper place, can be enjoyed and 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 have pleasure in those things but knowing that these are just pointers back to the ultimate the transcendent the thing that is god in the garden god told adam to what tend the garden and keep it so i Mm. but then there's a curse so i don't think work itself is a curse but work has been cursed through the fall and Mm. so if our striving is for fulfillment through our work and through our material, then we're missing the mark and we're falling short and we'll always be chasing after the wind. And so if we're trying to find fulfillment on grasping the wind and holding on to it, we're going to just be chasing and never feeling and always feeling half empty or just all one, <clears throat> one, you know, it's just slightly out of, out of reach. Um, and, or there's a mode of being where it's like it seems like the way that we're set up in this world is there's a need we have physical needs that if we don't provide we're gonna die and so i i just don't I, yeah I, I don't know i don't mean just think there's a ways to go i think it's about the mode of being i guess is the simple way um there's a song that uh, i would was in my head all morning so i don't know if it's applying or not but i'm just going to read it real quick it says i've been sick and tired of being sick and tired searching far and wide for something that feels real i need something real i don't want to lose my soul chasing after things that don't lead me straight to you i'm lost in the feeling that i'm not from this world and i think that that's that's that that angst because we're, we're there's a duality to our our physical now so we're we're made we're we're from the we're from the dust he formed us from the dust but that's not what makes us who we are he breathed his ruach his breath of life into adam and we all carry that and so what will what will depart from us is not who we genuinely are we are spirit beings inhabiting a physical body for the time but and so if our if our whole orientation is to the physical and to feeding that and to trying to nurture that physical, it can get out of hand. Because I don't think there's nothing there's nothing in and of itself, in my opinion, wrong with eating or drinking or working or X, Y, or Z. There are things that we can say, okay, you, you know, or sex. Like, if there, all those things. Concubines? Are, those are all good things. Mm, just kidding. Um, and so it's... Not the concubines. It's oh, wait. How, how she you, said... It's how you do it. And so there's that passage in Corinthians, like, whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. <laughs> That's the way I apply it to my life. And I, I, but I'm. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's I think people, I think it, John made a good point earlier that it's like, yes, 100 percent. But God might be calling you to be doing something different with your life than we are currently doing. And we right. don't want to just yeah, as a cop absolutely. out say, we always want to be testing our heart. And I think that's that, what it comes down to. Oh, no, that well, wasn't that like, goes, I know yeah, that's that not back to what the, you're that saying. That goes back but to just, the reason behind why you're doing whatever yeah. you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and I think it's probably, a, well, I, I, we said a lot, but both and uh, I think there's, 
I think if you were living your life just serving the Lord all the time and you were making sacrifices in your own life, it's like, oh man, if I'm going to, like, let's just say you wrote it on paper, I'm going to give two days of every week to just, just devote that to like serving his kingdom and, and pursuing whatever. Okay, well, th- that's going to deduct this much from my pay every month. It means I'm about to sell this house and I'm about to get one that's one third smaller. You know, it doesn't actually work out like that, but let's say let's say that was what you were doing you're like you know what okay I'm, i want to serve his kingdom his first and then and all of my you know and, and as far as my needs those will be provided for he's promised me that and i'm going to trust that i'm going to literally walk in there but then also but i'm not glorifying god in the rest of my life well then that would be a total waste you know what i'm saying because one my relationship with god would probably rot away and then the reason i'm doing all these things would become 100 percent for striving or eventually even to look like I'm serving the Lord. Um, so I definitely think it's a both and where it's like, of course, in every moment, we need to be have our, our heart in the right place, our intentions in the right place, serving God, serving our family, serving our children, serving our friends in the right place at home, and doing the work that we are doing from the right place, a place of being a child of God and Christ in us. And, you know, at any point, be able to, like Paul says, to be able to, you know, defend our position in Christ. And this is why I believe what I believe and be ready and in season and out. But then also too, like what if there's, you know, and I'm sure for every person the call is different, right? Like that's why a relationship with God is so wonderful because it's so um, personal for each person. But I think, um, I think a healthy message would be to, you know, be spreading a message of like, Hey, leave room there. And it, you know what I mean? That there may come a time where, you know, there is a there. There's a time for everything. It's another thing he says in Ecclesiastes. The very next verse starts with a time for everything. You know, there may be a time where God says, "Okay, you're doing really well in this, and I'm, you know, and now I want to use you. I want to, I want to bless you even more by allowing you to serve me even more." And maybe it, it comes to a point where there is, you know, more. Um, I don't know. I think our relationships with God can ebb and flow and how he uses can ebb and flow too. So, and there's probably, like I said, there's probably a lot of overlap. Everyone's call is different. Um, but even like last night, we had a men's group last night, a couple of new, new guys showed up who were young. They were like 18 and 19. And it's like, man, I'm so glad we have this men's group. And that whole conversation just sparked up from, you know, it's been amazing how many people just have just come out of the woodwork who now are part of our men's group. And it's, um, you know, like for me, it's like, those are eternal things. Those are eternal things, you know, like we're sitting here and carving out time in our lives to talk about the Lord, this podcast, you know, and I'm sure if you look in any Christian's life, there's going to be some things here and there that are like, oh yeah, these are eternal things. So I don't know. My challenge to myself always and to others is like, I don't know, you know, I know how I feel in those moments when I'm serving God. I know it takes a step of faith to really trust Matthew six Matthew six but um i don't know I, I feel like i usually try to be counterculture in general so it's like literally everyone on earth they're not seeking first his kingdom they're seeking first their own kingdom and they're not seeking his righteousness they're seeking their own righteousness and so it's like oh man it's, it's super counterculture to be like okay i'm actually going to take my eyes off my kingdom altogether in a sense as far as like what the future looks like and and even still that's extremely hard for me because it's like okay well we need to have these investments we need to do this we need to do this you know what i mean and so it's like uh, don't get me wrong i'm not doing it sold out you know what i mean but it's like i i can i try to imagine someone's life and be like no man someone like i don't know i think of like john the baptist like he lived in the wilderness he was sold out like there was no invest there was no retirement fund you know what I mean? There was no, like, he ate bugs, and it's like, but look at what his life, like, he paved the way, and it was like, oh, my gosh. So I can see how there's a there's a light there. I just, you know, Damn, I'm not I'm, there yet. I'm in full but, agreement with that. But on know. the flip side of that, um, I was, last year, I mean, I was, I came to the men's group every every other week. <clears throat> bi-weekly, bro. Bi-weekly. Um, but <laughs> well, now. We're all bi-weekly now. But now I'm in a season of being extremely busy with work. But I also see that as an eternal thing because I'm doing it for the glory of God. The byproduct of that is my income will be higher. And so there's a there's a benefit there of that, but that doesn't mean that it's less of an eternal thing. You see no, what I'm saying? No, absolutely not. So I, what you're just saying reminds me of whenever they were rebuilding the, um, the temple in Jerusalem after the... 
uh, what was it called? The uh, exile after the exile, or whatever. And so a lot of the men left their towns to go build, but then they also collected money from other people who weren't able to actually go. So it's one hundred percent both. And I'm, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that, Finn, because I feel like I do a bad job where I'm, I'm like bringing up a point. And it's not to discard all the other, like, no, you have to yeah. have money to be able to build anything. And so God is going to put pe- some people in a place where it's like, hey, I need you to be an income earner. This is how you can serve me in a wonderful way and and glorify me with the money that I've given you. Um, and, and then, Joseph, and, and then there's going to be some who are why, on When you're talking about John the Baptist, it's like, that's one way. And then you have one Joseph way. of Arimathea, yeah. who was, I think, wealthy. He had a stone tomb that he gifted to Jesus yeah, for absolutely. his burial. No, you're and right. he was in the the whole hierarchy of the the system in Jerusalem at that time. He was part of the I don't know if it was a Sanhedrin, but he was definitely part of the leadership of the Jews. But he was a believer and um, had means and was able to bless the physical body of Jesus when he was buried and fulfill that prophecy. Um, so it's like yeah, but at the end of the day, it's it, it's we almost overcomplicate it. But we can also play mental. We can also trick ourselves into saying. I'm doing everything for the Lord. I sold everything. I'm doing it for the Lord. And God's like, I never mm-hmm. asked you to do that. In fact, I wanted you to be over here and you disregarded it. I think that's why it's so important to be in community, having discussions like this, having brothers and sisters in your life that are iron sharpening iron and challenging and, you know, questioning and know no, know enough about where you are at to be able to, that you can't deceive yourself into thinking, because I, I know I can do it sometimes. Like, I'm doing it, I, I'm, you know, I, it happens to me. So I'll just use myself as an example. Sometimes I can be overly pursuing the things of the world. And I need to remind myself, it's like, this is not where you're going to find life. I pursue it subconsciously as if this thing is going to make me... I get fixated on projects. So right now I'm building a shed to Mackenzie's much... Still not done with that thing? No, dude. I get like... <laughs> Dude, no but what's excuse. crazy? It's like no, uh, as a dad, man, everything how takes far along six are times you? as long as well, you thought. It, well, I told him, I mean, it's built. The root, everything's. Uh, I just keep doing a little bit extra here and there. I just uh, basically, I need like one more week of like eight hours a day, five days, and I would be done with everything. It's but it's like I don't have forty hours to do in one week. I've got to do like two hours on one day. So it's just. It just takes. Finn, I, I told you that mural of yourself without your shirt off on the side of it was going to take forever, <laughs> and it is. No, nope, it's just vinyl siding. He just no. wants his daughters to see that and be like, "That's what you need." To but do. I will say this: I, I, I don't know, man. This is um, it's like a hobby. I get, I did like five hours of work on it yesterday, honestly, and um, like it was, it went by like it was like half an hour. Yeah, and I loved every second of it. It's like it was, <laughs> but I look back and it's like, well, at the end of the day, that shed will get built. We'll live there for however long at this house, and then somebody else will. It's like literally the journey of building it is what's satisfying and fun. As soon as it's done, it'll store stuff. Yeah, and it's like it's really kind of pointless and meaningless. Um, and I think that's a lot of life. It's like a cliche as it sounds. It's, it is true. It's like, it's a journey, not the destination. And we strive to get to the destination as fast as possible and to achieve the thing that we think is going to be it. It's like, once it's done, it's like, Oh, well, well, that's done. What's next? Yeah. Because it's never about the destination. And that's the reality. We can run the race like Paul talks about and run it well. And everybody's race might look different, but it's the running of the race that's important. It's the participating in this side of eternity by the indwelling life of Christ in us that is the race that's set before all of us. And it's going to manifest itself differently in everybody's lives that's following that truly and really walking that path and and going in that way. But it's like, it's that perspective. It's like, dude, it, we're going to find our ultimate destination when we pass away like that's that's it but for right now like we have an opportunity to run the race and it's all about the journey right now and is bringing as many other people along on that journey as possible and and bringing them into fellowship yeah with um 
it's very much like working a puzzle, like what you were just talking about. It's like <clears throat> the whole time you're working a puzzle, at first it's super hard, it's, it's fun, just chaos, and, then you get and all, lost all of a sudden, yeah. yeah, then all of a sudden you get to the end, you're like, the whole time you wanted to finish it, but as soon as you're done, you're like, well, dang, like this activity is now over. And um, Or like a vacation always feels the same way in the flight home. You're like, well, that was, that was, no, it's done. But um, I was just talking to a pastor yesterday. We went and picked up a piano for somebody, and um, old guy, man, and he's... Got another piano? He said, no, not for us, not for us. <laughs> I... Uh, it was some. It was a lot smaller than one we got. But anyway, so. Um, oh, you got big piano at your house, dude. I can't get like. I don't even want it in there anymore, and it's gonna cost like another five hundred bucks to move it. It's like a thousand pounds. Seriously. <laughs> just start cutting it up. It's a yeah. Honda. And we thought we were in the living room. No, I show like the whole house. Yeah, we took we took five guys with us to <laughs> go pick house. it up and walked. We walked right back out. We're like, nah, no. <laughs> the whole house is organized around the piano. <laughs> yeah, right. We uh, Levi sleeps in the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fun um but no so uh he was he was telling me i because I, I asked him i was like man um i asked him where, where he went to seminary and all that and um i asked him if there's you know a piece of advice he could give for someone who um feels led to at least one day preach or to be trending that way and his it was simple man he said um just trust that the lord will guide you and he will and always just trust where he's at wherever he's leading you <clears throat> and i feel like that just i don't know at first it was like oh that's kind of too simple like i already got that or you know but the reality is it's, it's been kind of ringing in my head i think for each person is trusting where the lord is leading you and a lot of times just in conversation it's hard not to paint with wide brushes you know um so yeah I'm, i think a good message we could have as a podcast crew here i don't know in summation would be you know be open to any way god can use your life whether that's to bless your finances and then you in turn bless the kingdom or for you to give your time or or any any person could be any mix of both or you could have both in your life at different times you know what i mean and so mm-hmm. but i think the whole thing is if we're truly trying to grow deeper in our relationship with him all the time day in and day out and also too taking this these verses as wisdom and say hey never forget the things that the things that you need in order to survive are never going to be the things that fulfill you because you were made of two parts and these are only fulfilling half of that which is your yeah your body's needs and the other part which i would say maybe even the bigger part as a christian is the spiritual and these are never they can never provide that yeah um and then also the last part it, it's resonated before and then when we when you brought this up enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work like that's what he lands on and just the other day i was cutting trees and um, kind of sat down in the shade afterwards and was just sitting there and I'm like, man, my body feels tired, but it feels good. And I even said, there's only one way to get that feeling and that's to actually do something uh-huh. and to work. Yeah. And so I, I imagine that like, I imagine that on one side for other people, it's art for other people. It's serving their customers really well in a way where it's like, man, I crushed it. And I could tell in their voice that they appreciated how well I did my job. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I think there's all kinds of that same thing just in different fields, you know? I think so. all work is, um, all productive work at least, is like bringing a, an order out of a, a disorder. Like you can know what a garden looks like because it is distinct. It's ordered. There's intelligence behind it. That And it requires cultivation and continuous reordering. And, and, and there is some, we are created for that. We were created to work. Um, like you said, Josiah earlier, what, what was your quote exactly? It's, it's not that work is sinful. It's that work, work itself is not a curse. Work has been cursed. Yes. Yes. And we can redeem it by working in such a way that is glorifying to God. And what is that? I mean, practically speaking from somebody's outside perspective, it might look identical. That sounded like a nice person on a phone call with a client. One person is not a believer. The other one was, one could be storing up treasures in heaven. The other one was not. And, but from the outside perspective, it looked, that's what I was going to say, like, practically speaking, what does that start to look like? And it's like, from the outside, it could look exactly the same, but from the spiritual perspective, it's radically different. Hmm. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 says, all labor of man is for his mouth, yet his soul is not satisfied. And once again, I, I think it's, if we're trying to do these things to satisfy who we genuinely are, because we're, we're soul spirit creatures that live in a body. So if we're trying to nourish our soul by the 
try to attain all these things, it's it's always going to be empty. But you can do those. There's you get touches of that fulfillment though sometimes through doing physical things. I don't think there's anything wrong with the physical of it. Um, what one other thing? Uh, yeah, there were two young guys here last night, and I I wasn't there for how Jonathan connected with them. But the under, the story I understood was you were doing some things pertaining to just general life, like having to get your oil changed in your car. And through that interacted with these guys to them showing up, which in my mind is like, your heart might've been like, I'm going out to seek the lost and, and, or maybe it was like, Hey, I, I'm a Christian. And so therefore that's always somewhere in the forefront of my mind, but I'm not, I'm not going to the auto parts store to, go proclaim the gospel i'm going there for to get stuff oil but in conjunction with that there's fruit that is reaped because of your orientation as a christian and and so yeah it's i never want to be like well this is the only way to do it but i do think most of us most of the fruit that i've seen through my life has been those times where it's not like this i'm going out it's like the in the midst of is where I've seen it now, but that's not a one size fits yeah, all. So it's discount. not like it's not a discount to the other exactly. There's a need for intentionality, and so yeah, I don't want to undermine any of those things. But anyway, I was just thinking about that. Like those two guys were here last night because you were trying to get your oil changed on your cars, and so it's like that's a cool byproduct because of you being a Christian. You had a bracelet on, and once again, I wasn't there. That was my understanding of the conversation from how you all connected. But um, I think there's something cool about that. Um, which then kind of leads into, I feel like we can't wrap up the podcast without how Ecclesiastes ends, because I feel like that is like, he goes through this whole thing and then he's like, oh, by the way, I have the right answer, but I wanted to kind of take you through this whole up and yeah. down. Let me, let me pause right there before you close it out yeah, with that. So uh, I guess my biggest fear with that is, because I totally agree, there's so many times where like, pretty much most of the people I think that we end up coming across that, that need, <clears throat> you know, that, that we could for the gospel with or whatever, like those interactions are, are brought by God and God leads us to people whose soil is ready. You know what I mean? I absolutely 100% agree. I, I guess my fear would be, um, I think as believers, I think it's healthy to, to not like build walls around that, you know, not that anybody's doing that, but what I wouldn't want to do is be like, okay, well, as long as I'm doing this, then God is going to like, like, oh, I think it's always healthy to like leave room there. Right. So like God does lead you to someone and it's like, oh man, this person really needs, like I could really pour into this person's life. It's going to cost me a little bit, but like just being open to that idea. I think if we're spreading the message, um, to ourselves and other people, it's like, as long as we're like, yes, I think the first needs to be there. We're always in communion with God. We're always, when someone sees us, something about you, like that guy, I mean, it was the bracelet I had on a WWJD bracelet, which praise the Lord. I yeah, knew dude, it was I had, worth I, wearing, I, man. I had, I've had multiple. Yeah, yeah, but also, too, yeah, being ready in season and out, but also, like, I, I guess I'm just saying it's like, as long as we're never like, no, this is what I do to serve the Lord, and that's it, you know, because I feel like as soon as we do that, God will uh, God will kick that door down and be like, nope, we're doing something else now, just to open our horizons on purpose, you know, so. But anyway, sorry to No, no, that's good. There. That's good. Um... Yeah, the end of Ecclesiastes <clears throat> says, Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Man, dude, there would have been a time in my life where I'd be like, uh oh. <laughs> There would have been a time in my life that I would have said that. But I think that that is the... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if there's... Any, I think you could sit there and chew on that for a long time. Yeah, if you could... But. If people would... Because it says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says he's placed eternity in the human heart and then bring it back to... There's going to be a judgment one day. People, people are pursuing to fill that void of eternity with all this other stuff, but... There's a Jesus say pole in their heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I bet. See, this puzzle is, piece. Yeah, the the struggle though is That's probably cliche, most of our listeners true. and all of us have probably been like, "What well, I've had Jesus, but yet I still feel this over here." And so, how do we bring the two together? And I think that that's the issue. I think if as Christians, if we can start to walk more fully in who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, what we're intended for, what what real purpose looks like as a Christian. Not necessarily, yeah, anyway. But, like, that's where we start to 
actually apply the antidote that we proclaim to everyone else, the more we apply that to our own lives, the less we have to like. Anyway, yeah. I just, it's just I the see more it it's, it's so simple though. It's just no regard for myself. Right. No, that, that's easy to say, but. Well, I think it's um. <clears throat> it is easy to say. And sometimes it's like everything we just talked about this morning is things that I know are true and I have known that are true. And if you were asked me yesterday, I would have told you that, yes, these things are true. And sometimes it feels like talking about it is just talking about it. But I think it is very important to talk about it because it is what reminds you, along with Christian brothers, like having a conversation like this, I guarantee you today I will be more aware of and taking the thoughts captive in the way I want to pursue life today. And my even just, I've got roof inspections today, just like I had yesterday and the day before. But having this conversation will spur me on to desire and pursue those things in, from a more eternal perspective, because we had the conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like, well, stop talking about it and do it. It's like talking about it does help spur on the doing it. Yep. And listening to conversations like this will help spur on the doing it. And it's a constant on this side of eternity, that's going to be a constant thing that needs to be reminded, speaking truth into one another's lives and, and having conversations like this. And this is just one aspect of it. It's like pursuing the things of the kingdom. And Jesus says it so succinctly and, and perfect, you know, pursue first the things of God and then everything else will be added. It's like, yeah, amen. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's important to have this conversation to remind ourselves of these things because the world is literally saying the opposite in every direction. Even yesterday, I'm walking out of the the Harris Teeter or whatever and there's like the lottery machine there and it's huge and it has a big digital screen find on the happiness front. if you win no it had a guy weeping and it said at the bottom it said if you want to weep for or like uh, play so you can weep for joy or whatever or something like that and I'm sitting there and I'm like what what a fake but there are times you know as believers when man the spirit just hits you and you're weeping for joy and it's like oh, there's almost no feeling like that and but anyway they're trying to act like that can even happen just from money or from winning the lottery and I don't know I think the, it's like we do, we have this natural tendency on this earth to say, oh man, like if you have marital problems at home, you're going to have marital problems in a brand new house too. Or if you have, if you have um, depression or whatever, or or you're having these, whatever struggles you have in your current situation, fast forward two years from now, as soon as the the shiny new thing of the new house wears off, you're going to still, they're going to be there too. Or if you have, you know, anger issues or whatever it is in the old car you have, you're still going to have them in the new car once that shiny wears off. And so it's like knowing that or whatever stressors there are in your life that you just crawl under and are overwhelmed by, like changing your surroundings is not going to change what's going on within. And I think that this is, I'm not saying it directly, but in some ways it also applies here too. It's like, hey man, like, you know, all eventually it's just, it's going to be meaningless in terms of helping you feel better about those things, even in the here and now. So, uh, yeah. What's racking in my brain real quick is uh, Jonathan's – that was before we started the podcast. His prayer, did he, You prayed before we started the podcast, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm just thinking about your prayer, kind of like, Lord, specifically for this morning, whoever is listening to this, let us speak the words for that person to receive what they need to hear. Right? Uh, that, hmm. And what I'm thinking about is – the cool thing about our group here is we all have different avenues the way we think about things and i think that that's cool and so we approach it from different angles and what i'm just thinking about here is if if one of us didn't say what we said then somebody somebody on the receiving end pulled something that maybe maybe i lean more one way and and jonathan leads another way and brett leads one way and fenley but like my guess is if somebody has ears to hear and is actually in the mode where it's like, hey, I'm trying to gain some something, not just some head knowledge, but like application, probably somebody's listening to this and, and feeling convicted, like, no, I need to be cutting out some things out of my life and pursuing God more more in, in, in intentional things, serving and being tied into groups of people that are believers and fellowshipping others. And maybe there's some people that are like, man, I'm just in a state of life where maybe... I, it, as much as I want to be there, I can't. And so now I need to recognize that Christ is still with me in the midst of all these other things 
that and so like there's that that anyway i'm just kind of thinking of that it's like man praise the lord for different aspects in this group and i I just really trust that the lord is speaking to whoever's listening to this and they might have received something different from each one of us and i think that's the cool thing about this group of guys and i just trust that jonathan's prayer was heard from the lord and that's whoever's listening whatever needed to be heard start to trust the lord play button though on youtube well if they, they hit it if they've listened to this part so anyway i yeah. know anyway, i'm just thinking about that prayer and just thinking about this conversation and how it can be like oh well we disagree or it's like no praise the lord for the fact we have multiple views and perspectives on the to kind of flesh this out in a more more fuller and more abundant way so that whoever's on the receiving end can receive what they need to hear and apply that to their own life so amen 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 Until so, next time, no, or are we going to pray? We, yeah, let's pray, dude. My, sure. <laughs> All right, bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of, okay, cool. Instead of praying, we'll just tell you about a prayer. <laughs> no, it's I'm going to ask you a question, but um, I'm not going to ask you the actual question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Lord, thank you for this morning. And um, Father, help us, to, uh, help us to glorify you in everything that we do, um, whether that be... Um, an act of service, um, pouring into the lives of someone else, or, um, or just being in, in the vicinity of someone else that you've actively put in our lives, Lord. Let us, let us glorify you in that place. Let us glorify you in our own homes, with our families, and the way we treat our spouses, and the way we treat our roommates, the way we treat our children, the way we treat our own parents that are outside of the house, Lord. Let us be a light there just as much or even more, and um, Lord, even in our own hearts, um, Lord, let us let us glorify you in the things we do apart from everyone else, and let us glorify you so that you can look at us and one day say, um, in you I'm well pleased, and Lord, I just ask that it's all your power that allows us to do that, it's your power that allows us to become um, more like you, and so I just ask that you would just fill us with with that, and um, on, a, on a daily basis, Lord, just let us incrementally become more like you so that when people see us, whether it's in any of those scenarios, um, they just see you, and they want more of it. And, uh, yeah, we love you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Until next time. <laughs>